Thank you very much, Kelly, for that very, very nice introduction. Chairman Wilson, Vice Chairman Alexander, President Cobb, the outstanding executive director of the NAACP, Ben Hooks, You know, if I could speak like Ben, I could make something out of my life. <laughs> to Governor Julian Carroll, who next week will host the National Conference of Governors in Louisville as chairman of that organization. Two of the finest United States senators in the country, dear friends of mine, Wendell Ford and Dee Huddleston. <laughs> Your own Congressman Mazzoli, Congressman Hopkins, the next governor of Kentucky, John Y. Brown. Where are you, John? And, and if you don't think he's going to be the next governor of Kentucky, meet Mrs. John Y. Brown. <laughs> Judge McConnell, Mayor Stansbury, my dear friend, old colleague, co-conspirator, <laughs> the 101st Senator of the United States Senate, <laughs> Clarence Mitchell. <laughs> Judge Keith, Louis Martin, Rosa Parks, and dear friends. <laughs> Kelly mentioned that I grew up under the best, Hubert Humphrey. And when I went to the Senate on the last day of 1964 to replace Hubert, who was going to become vice president, I went up to him and I said, Hubert, what do I turn to, where do I turn for advice on civil rights and education and social justice in America? He said, why don't you do exactly what I've done? Just go to Roy Wilkins and Clarence Mitchell and do exactly what they tell you to do. <laughs> and that's exactly what I've done. And more than that, that's exactly what the nation is doing. If anyone doubts the strength of the NAACP, let him come here tonight and see this magnificent turnout of leaders from across the country. The history of justice in America is the history of the NAACP. It's been in the forefront of every struggle for social justice and human rights in America for 70 years. And I'm proud to be among you this evening as we chart future course. And I want to thank the sponsors of today's event for inviting me. You know, it's somewhat dangerous to invite a vice president. <laughs> Just the other day I was listening to an interview of a woman who lived next to the Three Mile Plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they said, lady, how does it feel to be living so close to this stricken nuclear plant? She said, it's okay, it's safe why the president was here the other day. Well, he said, what makes that safe? Well, she said, if it were dangerous, they would have sent the vice president. <laughs> and here I am, here I am. It's an honor to join with you in charting the future of our country and to know that the leadership of this organization is one of the finest in the country. No or 
organization has a better executive director, more able, more gifted than the NAACP. And no organization ever had a head of their Washington office that even remotely equals Clarence Mitchell. And we're going to train Althea so she's even better. Great. We're going to do that. Louie and I will take care of that. What a history this has been. What excellent leadership you have. What a future this nation has. And it is especially fitting that tonight that we honor someone who helped start it all, Rosa Parks. Nearly 25 years ago, the eyes of the world were turned toward Montgomery, Alabama. When this strong lady refused to yield her seat, she said she was tired. Tired because she'd been shopping all day. Tired of inequality. Tired of a nation that said one thing and did another. <laughs> tired of injustice. And tired as she was, she and the decent citizens of that city walked to work. They walked for 382 days through winter might be doing that again for different reasons. <laughs> Through winter and spring and summer and fall. And soon people around the nation begin to walk. We walked for 10 years in Selma, in Montgomery, in Chicago, in Washington, until year after year, march after march, this nation began to redeem its highest promise, namely equality for all. One of the great leaders of that movement was my old friend Huber. He was with you in the Senate, fighting for you, winning with you on all the great issues for which you stood. I was proud to be with him during those years. Together we fought for a Voting Rights Act and won. Together we fought for the Fair Housing Act, which I was privileged to be the chief sponsor of, and won. <laughs> Together we fought for a little noted but profoundly important program known as the Legal Services Program to give poor people the right to go into court and assert the laws on behalf of their interests and the interests of justice. We fought for Title I and Head Start and school lunches and won. But the important thing is you, you did more than strengthen the rights for black Americans. And that's the central point. Every victory that the civil rights movement has won in America has strengthened all of America. This is a national effort. When someone gets a good education, when they enter the professions, when they vote, they strike a blow not just for black Americans, but for this nation. This nation needs you. It needs this organization. It needs your brains, your talent, your heart. And one of the great triumphs of the Civil Rights March and movement was that at last this country began to harness the energy and the talent and the spirit and the love and the patriotism of black America. But as Ben Hooks loves to say, there's always one more river to cross. In fact, there are two rivers, at least, 
lying before us. First, we must continue the ceaseless expansion of civil rights for all Americans. We've done a lot, but we have not yet completely won the fight against discrimination in America. That fight is not over. And secondly, we have just begun the real fight, and that is the fight for economic equality in this country. We must continue to fight for the right to sit anywhere on that bus, but increasingly we also have to fight for a fair chance to be the driver of the bus, and even more than that, to own the bus company. Those were the goals that you had in mind when you elected us in 1976. And I want to report to you tonight on the trust that you placed in us and what we're trying to do to respond to the confidence that you showed in us. First of all, we have remained strong, indeed recommitted this nation to the enforcement of civil rights laws, and we've done it in several ways. First of all, this president was the first in America to officially call for the right of the citizens of the District of Columbia to elect their own senators in Congress with voting rights in the Congress. A very important reform for this nation and one that needs your support all over this country. Secondly, we have fully supported the policy of affirmative action. Abraham Lincoln once referred to the unfettered chance in life. That unfettered chance was denied to blacks and other minorities for centuries. Affirmative action is the way to overcome the effects of long denial. Let me state it as directly as I can. We regard Bakke as a green light for affirmative action, and we hope that the Weber case will do the same. For we believe that affirmative action is a crucial... By the way, if you want to break in with applause, just let it rip. Don't worry about a thing. I, I'm just like Ben Hooks. I got all night. Finally, we did something that needed to be done for years, and Clarence knows what I'm talking about. Louie knows what I'm talking about. One of the ways that civil rights enforcement was hampered was by a federal structure that scattered the offices all over town so that there was plenty of offices and no enforcement. What we did was to reorganize, working with the NAACP, reorg I understand it's been renamed the NCAA tonight. <laughs> just lost a vote. He's here. <laughs> we sat down with the NAACP, the other civil rights organizations, the expert, and we reorganized the whole federal structure to put it in a few strong offices with the authority and the budget to do it. And we did one other thing, which has never, in my opinion, been done before. We not only put people in charge of these offices with a good record in civil rights, we put the pros in charge of it. It's one thing to say you're for civil rights, it's another thing to put Eleanor Holmes Norton in charge of that office. Then you know you got something. <laughs> we put Drew Days and Dave Tatel and the other veterans of the civil rights movement in charge of these offices. Secondly, we are proud that this administration, while not doing enough, has appointed more black Americans and other minority Americans to high offices than any other administration in American history. <laughs> Who is it that represents and symbolizes this nation to all other nations in the world? It is Andy Young, and I'm proud of our ambassador.
who runs this nation's housing and urban development programs as fine a secretary as we've ever had, Pat Harris? Who is the Solicitor General of the United States, Wade McCree? Who runs Walter Mondale? Louis Martin. <laughs> Cliff Alexander, the Secretary of the Army. And may I was pleased this morning, it was my privilege to swear in a black member of the Federal Reserve Board, Emmett Rice, and place again a black American on that crucial area. That, uh, we're delighted to have him there. We will appoint over 15% of this year's nominees to the federal bench and the circuit bench, people like Damon Keith to the federal judiciary. And included among those nominations and new judges are some of the best, including Nate Jones, the general counsel of the NAACP. But I'm not here to say we've done enough. And we'll keep working on it, and I know you'll see to it that we keep working on it. <laughs> the fight for equality is also a fight for economic justice as well. It begins with jobs. If people don't have jobs and need them, they don't have anything. It's got to begin with jobs. I cannot claim that we have full employment, we all know better. But I can claim with justification that the pro-full employment policies of this administration has resulted in adding eight million new jobs to the workforce in America, more new jobs added in such an interval than under the presidency of any other president in the history of the United States. In the state of Kentucky alone, as the governor will attest, there are 175,000 more people at work than on the day that President Carter was sworn in as President of the United States. One of the most heartbreaking yet to resolve issues, and you all know it, and I'm glad that this organization, and Ben Hooks was just talking to me about it, is going to work all out on it, has been, is the problem of youth unemployment. Someone once said, a rising tide lifts all boats unless your boat is in dry dock. And hundreds of thousands of young Americans, and especially hundreds of thousands of young black and minority Americans, are for all practical purposes still in dry dock, untouched by economic recovery. Some people say they don't want to work. That is an ignorant statement because every time, every time we have offered a few seated jobs, a few youth employment jobs in any city of this country and you talk to any employer in this country, they swamp the employment office because they want jobs. They want to work. They don't want welfare. You don't have to talk to the poor about the work ethic. They believe in it. What they need is the work and not any more advice. They're willing to go to work. But we've got to have the programs for that purpose. When we took office, there were no programs virtually for young people in this country. We have appropriated this year $4 billion for the first major effort to bring jobs directly to young Americans in this country. Our youth programs are three times the size of those in Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. We have doubled the CETA program, and we've doubled the Job Corps program, and we're beginning to see the results. Employment among black teenagers has increased by 127,000 in this country, but the number who are unemployed is so massive that when they hear a rumor of a job, they go and sign up for work, and the official statistic more than masks the progress that we've made. 
The jobless rate, as you know, remains entirely too high, but there are signs of hope. The unemployed have seen that employment is picking up. They're looking for work again. In part, these renewed attempts explain the high jobless rate. And one of the best ways to employ the minorities in this country is to make them also the employers. <laughs> the battle for equality is not just waged in the workshops. It is waged also in the banks and corporate headquarters where blacks, like just anyone else, have a right to be and where they have a contribution to make. That is why we have increased support for minority business by 36 percent. And while the president has pledged that the federal government will triple the size of its procurement for minority business, and why we've increased the set-asides for minority contracts, you know these programs where they in place do work. Last night I was at a dinner and I talked to 10 people who were businessmen who had gotten into the field, had good businesses as a result of this program, and there are many more like them around the country. This administration is committed to bringing to minorities the opportunity, as everyone else has it, to be a part of the entrepreneurial life of this country. Joe E. Brown, a great comedian, said, I have been rich, and I have been poor. Rich is better. And that means business and profits and participating in the credit and the banking institution. Oh, you know where the money is. That's what's important, and that will strengthen this nation and contribute enormously to social justice. The battle for equality is also waged in our major cities. That's where most Americans live. We inherited a government which had no urban program. Since then, we have framed the first comprehensive urban program ever, created and expand the urban development action grants and the economic development programs which didn't exist for all purposes in the cities of our country. As a result, more than $3 billion of grants, loans, guarantees, and tax incentives are available to the cities of our country. You ask any of the great black mayors of this country or any of the mayors of this country, Tom Bradley, Andy Hatcher, Ken Gibson, Coleman Young, Leonel Wilson, any of them, whether there hasn't been a profound difference in the way in which the federal government approaches the center cities of our country. The previous administration told the city of New York to drop dead. We said, come alive again. We want New York City to prosper, to grow, and we work with them, and that city's back on the move again. We believe in our cities. We want them to work. Finally, it's in education that I'm the proudest. Clarence knows all the years that I served in the Senate, I put my top priority working with this organization to give our kids a chance to learn and to aspire. A young person is the first one to know that he or she is failing. And you let a child go to a second-rate school and not learn those basic skills of reading, of writing, and math. Deny a child a chance to, to flower that comes from learning, and you're destroying a child before he or she ever had a chance. You're destroying them. As the United Negro College Fund said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, and we have to prevent it. And I want to say something which I think must be classified because no one knows about it. I stood behind and with Lyndon Johnson when we tried to push money into our schools and give poor kids a chance to learn. But even measured as against Lyndon Johnson, President Carter goes down as the most pro-education president in the American in the history of this country. We have increased educational support for the schools of this country over the last Ford budget by 60 percent. We've increased, and particularly in the areas that affect poor children, 
Title I, we've nearly doubled. We've increased student assistance by over 50%. We've doubled the amount of money available for the education of the handicapped in this country. Instead of trying to kill Head Start, we've added 40% to the funding of Head Starts. And after a long silence in Washington, this administration is standing up and say, we must have strong black colleges in America, and we're working for that objective. We have doubled student assistance going to black colleges. And the president has directed all agencies to join him in a government-wide push to help these colleges. Now, I know this isn't a perfect record. We haven't succeeded in every attempt. Many of the problems that we face are controversial, complex, and difficult to solve. But we've tried as hard as we can, and our hearts are in the right place. As Andy Young said recently, we ain't what we want to be, but thank God we ain't what we was. <laughs> the revolution is far from over, and there's a lot of things we've got to do together to win full justice in America. And I want to talk about six things briefly. Number one, we've got to get people to vote. When I've been in politics for 20 years, elected office, I've met a lot of dumb politicians in my life, but I never met a successful one who couldn't count. <laughs> the thing that moves this country is votes. There is a new strategy in this country through the massive amounts of money that are being spent. We've got to do something to correct that. I think we should substitute it with public financing because this country belongs to the people and not to those who just happen to have a lot of big money temporarily to try to buy the system. <laughs> but even with the present system, if everybody would vote, we'd solve our problems and solve them right away. There's no alternative but a strong program to encourage everyone to vote. I worry sometimes about some of the rhetoric I hear in American life today. And a lot of it is predicated on the belief that poor people, minorities, and others have gotten tired and lost interest in voting. Please continue the fine effort of this organization to get people into the polls voting for the best interests of our nation. Secondly, we must pass the bill that gives the Housing and Urban Development Department the power to issue cease and desist orders, orders that will put teeth into the fair housing law. <laughs> Pat Harris de deserves that. Third, we must pass the welfare reform bill. We tried to pass one last year, couldn't get it through. We're trying this year again. Our bill will create a uniform national benefit across the country, lift two million Americans out of poverty, create 400,000 new jobs, help us pass this bill. Fourth, and you gotta help us here, help us pass the strongest possible windfall profits tax on the oil companies of this country so that we can take this money and build America again. This morning, the wholesale and the consumer price index soared again, principally driven by the cost of energy, gasoline and heating oil and the rest. It's going up at a rate of 78% a year right now, oil and gas. And the reason is that this nation has got itself into a predicament where it's short of oil. We can correct that. It can be done. This nation, when they tried to deny us rubber in World War II, we went ahead and made our own synthetic rubber. When we decided to go to the moon, we went to the moon. And if this nation decides it's gonna solve its energy crisis, we can solve that too, and we will.
right here in the state of Kentucky. You've got enough coal to make this state the Saudi Arabia for coal in this world. Let's use it. Let's substitute coal for that oil for many reasons. It will help drink, bring down the cost of living, but something more importantly. No one should have anything to say about American foreign policy except Americans and no one else. Let us never get into a position where foreign sources of oil can intimidate the foreign policy of this country. We need to ratify the SALT agreement. I won't go into that. I understand it was touched on last night. But this generation of Americans, representing the nation that holds the largest source of nuclear power in the world, must deal responsibly both to enhance the security of our country, but just as importantly, to remember that we have a responsibility for our children and our grandchildren to pursue policies that prevent this world from resorting to the final madness that will destroy us all. Please help ratify the strategic armament agreements that we need. And finally, let me close on one final point. When we went into office, President Carter and I decided that we were going to pursue the principle of human rights in our foreign policy. That there could not be a disconnection between the policies that we pursue in international diplomatic affairs and the values of the American people. And we have done that. And nowhere is that change more apparent than in Africa. Before we took office, the Secretary of State of this country was practically unwelcome in Nigeria, which incidentally is the largest source of foreign oil for this country. Practically unwelcome. We had lost our credibility among the black African nations because we helped colonial powers to try to keep control of nations despite the fact that the vast majority of the people in those countries wanted the right to run their own affairs. And they played games on the whole issue of human rights. I am proud of the fact that one of the things that President Carter and this administration has done, with the help of Andy Young and Dave Mc Don McHenry and many others, and I've been a part of it too, is to implement in international affairs the same rules of democracy and freedom of justice that the NAACP is asking for in the conduct of the domestic affairs in this, our own country. We instituted the sanctions against Rhodesia. Early in our administration, I went to Vienna to tell the then Prime Minister of South Africa that things were different in the foreign policy of this country and that we were insisting on majority rule and human rights around this world. And that is what we have done. And right now that policy is in dispute. We have said we will not lift the sanctions on Rhodesia until they have majority rule and real democracy. Well, they say everything's all right over there. Everybody got to vote, unless you were a dissident. And you got to advertise if they agreed with what you were going to advertise. And the blacks got to vote, but not on the Constitution. 96% of the people of Rhodesia were denied any part in drafting or approving the Constitution of that country. And lo and behold, the Constitution prohibits the blacks for many years from being a major part of the police, the civil service, the defense structure, or foreign policy. We used to call that tokenism. And it's well known in America. It's an old trick, and we're on to it. We're on to it.
and we need your help. We've come a long way since Rosa Parks sat down in that bus. The battle for civil rights has made enormous progress, thank in great measure to this great organization. And through it all, we've been sustained by faith. Our faith that this country, however difficult its history, has a brighter future. That this people, however we've erred in the past, want to be decent. That our hearts, however hardened they may be, can be softened by a vision of brotherhood. This was the hope of one of America's greatest poets, Langston Hughes, who said, I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of this earth and every man is free. The NAACP put it different when they said, what does it say there? Tell it. Tell it. Together we can do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>